Welcome to the sixth class of the course Organizing Times of Crisis. On the topic is cross sectoral responses to managing refugee crisis, a theory practice dialogue. My name is Thomas Gegenhuber. I am a professor for socio technical transitions at the Johannes Kepler University Linz and a visiting professor at Leuphana University Lüneburg. And I'm doing something that's a little bit unusual and there's a reason why I say a theory practice dialogue um, because during this crisis I changed my role from being a researcher to someone who proactively helps uh, Ukrainian students uh, to come to Linz. And what I'm trying to do with this class and what I'm sharing with you is my attempt, based also on my experience, some reflections about particularly the issue of cross-sectoral management in times of crisis. And I think it's always important to know when you really do something, um, it's hard to take a step back uh, and reflect upon it. That's also the reason why science and, and management research is so important because when you're in the midst of doing something, um, this you don't have time uh, for reflection. For this course, uh, I seek to take this time, but as you also will see, it's it's still my early thoughts. I need to think more about this and reflect more upon this, but still I want to share my personal progress. So let's go to the first part, my personal experience. And when this terrible war happened uh, in February 24th, I, I was back driving home from holidays and even in the car I already realized um, what can I do? I asked myself the question and so I had the idea, can we organize housing for students? Because I think housing first, that's the, that's the most important thing they need in the moment, a safe place. Uh, but that idea elaborated that we said, you know, when I also talked to other people at university and the student dorms that we developed the idea is when people come, uh, we should focus on students and also give them something, you know, uh, to something, some hopeful activity in, in this dark time. So give them opportunity to continue their studies or at least do an abroad term. Um, so we combined the study programs, but it was very helpful that the JKU had uh, English programs with um, student housing. So these are two student dorms, um, the WIST and the Studentenwerk. So that's, that's how, that's the idea, that was the basic idea of this initiative. And to give a little bit an understanding how many people came here, we have around 66 students now here. Uh, these are the different study programs and as you can see more than the half come from uh, MINT subjects, so uh, like artificial intelligence, um, that's a program that has a lot of popularity among the students, but also like International Business Administration with 15 students has a large share of students. How did we organize this? And, and this was of course some ad hoc organizing, bottom up like thinking and bridging. So on the one hand, you had Ukrainian students who were looking for safety, uh, looking for housing, and also, yeah, uh, seeking to continue the study program in one way or another. And then you had the JKU on the other hand. And of course, the people know there is some kind of housing. And I did a lot of research in the area of platform organizing, crowdsourcing uh, with my colleagues here at JQ with uh, Robert Bauer and Elke Schüssler. 
and so you kind of have a platform situation in terms of there's a demand um, of people who don't know the local situation and then there are is a local institutions who want to help um, but of course also the situation is is new to them so what the role that I fulfilled is I played the role of an intermediary and th th sought to coordinate. So I tried to mobilize through an open call that this Ukrainian students know we have something to offer here. I tried to match students with JKU and housing. I improvised a lot and also did a lot of networking to organize support structure, but more on that in a few seconds. So this was the open call. It was basically um, a form where I said, hey, if you look for housing, um, write me. And uh, what happened then to this form is that I processed this form. Uh, when I realized there is also a match with the study program, I got in touch with uh, JKU and uh, the international office who created a mobility program. We also have a more program that already uh, that is provides material and social support for refugees and displaced students. We have um, also the GQ made a learning pledge uh, in German and Ukrainian language, and also admission office and university leadership helped. And for housing, of course, uh, the student work with, but also matched people to private housing in other dorms. And this was very important because. I originally like started with the idea of can we bring 15 students here um, but as you could see it became bigger because once I made the open call student housing said it can even help more and also international office said you know we can do more and more program said hey this is a good initiative we should do more on that so it became bigger over time it also became bigger because of I not only mobilized on the side of the making this open call to the Ukrainian students, but I also made a uh, broadcast call in Linz civil society. So we had within civil society in Linz there were several initiatives. I uh, also was part of initiatives where we made uh, an open call, and there was one group focusing on hey we want to help students. So we built a group consisting of. Uh, current JKU staff um, and students, but also former JKU students and students from the Ukraine and created a study buddy uh, program um, that is this led by a colleague, Christine Schäfer. And this is providing material and social support and also facilitate community building. So this is, you know, because to some extent our existing programs, more programs deal with that, but to have given the sheer volume of students coming in, uh, we felt like there's a need for another support structure. And then I had, of course, additional advice from support. I had one friend in Vienna who has Polish background, as particularly in the beginning of the crisis, organizing travel assistance, how to cross the border, how to get safely to Linz. Um, which was particularly important, you know, we have a lot of female students, uh, so also to ensure, give safety tips, etc. We were also in touch with local uh, Ukrainian civil society initiatives, and because of government support, I, I got in touch with government and also welfare organizations. How can we get, what type of funding is available for the students? Um, because. We have the Grundversorgung and here people, students could get rent support uh, so we could give the rent support money to the student dorms which allowed us to even take more students. So these were the kind of things I, I coordinated and of course a lot of improvising when you have uh, students coming here and saying we don't have a laptop, we don't have anything and I work in the Open Innovation Center and one of my neighbors is Dynatrace and ask hey do you have laptops for us? And they organized a few laptops for those who, who left the war uh, with, without much stuff. So we could also give them something that could continue their studies. And 
what I also experienced in the middle of this picture, uh, you could see um, the provincial minister, state minister for social affairs and integration, uh, congratulating JKU uh, for the accomplishments. We have a few Ukrainian students here in this image, uh, and the staff from the MOA program and academic supervisor of the MOA program, Professor Hans Bacher. And it was great to see that uh, the provincial government asking what can we do to organize long-term support uh, for your initiative. And through this organizing process, uh, I also got aware of this initiative in, in Germany. It's organized by Project Together. I'm going to say later something about which I know from other research uh, I've done within the last two years, but I found this image so and the alliance they wanted to create so striking and they're asking how can we create an alliance of civil society organizations, foundations, government institutions, corporations to create an ecosystem because with this influx of refugees, how can we better support them? How can we work together to support them? And this alliance is supported by um, the federal German government. And you, you can see some areas where they try to organize support. And now I want to take that you take a, a brief break. Um, and in the second part, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the reflection based on my experiences. Welcome back. Um, so now it's part two, my, my reflection. And first element of reflection I want to share, and just very briefly, because this one is not so developed, um, but I found it interesting. This is something I want to think more about. What do calls to action play in ad hoc organizing? Uh, because, as mentioned, I did a lot of work on, on crowdsourcing and, and platforms. And if you want to create platforms, mobilizing, I think, is an essential feature of platforms. And I want to think more about it because I define now mobilizing, issuing a call to action. So other people give something, but also receive something um, based on the plausible promise. And I realize you always need to start something. It started with, can we have 15 spaces for students? This was a plausible promise for the student dorms, but also for the uni, let's give something. This was received by the students as a good offer. And then my email addresses, the you, existing Ukrainian students who came here or got in touch with me also give the email addresses to others and uh, to university faculty. So I added up, ended up being my email address on, on certain lists. So we got more and more incoming uh, emails and requests to people to come here that led me to go to the storms and say, do we have more space and can we find more space? And they were willing to help, but also other people, the private people who have private housing came to me so it became stronger so this idea of based on initial small plausible promise when you make an open call to how does it get amplified and what can you add to it that, that is something I want to spend more time thinking about but what I really want to focus with you because I think that's where my reflection is more developed is 
how can the various societal sectors contribute to resolving a crisis. Um, exactly based on, on what they did in Germany, where initiative emerged and really also formalized this idea of how can we facilitate cross-sectoral collaboration in times of crisis. So I think there is an important idea of it uh, behind it. And I want to explain why. Why? Um, because when we think we have different sectors playing a different role within our society and there's a division of labor uh, among the sectors, each se sector has comparative strengths, but also maybe some pathologies and weaknesses. And if we can bring everyone together, maybe we can on the one hand get the best of each world and at the same time mitigate some of the pathologies. And the three dominant sectors we would think about would be the government, civil society and the private sector. But still, this is a little bit too... It's not precise enough because what is civil society? Uh, civil society is something that's between... It's not government, it's not family, but it's also not the private sector. We need to be a little bit more precise in our analysis. And that's what I want to do with you now. Uh, to show you um, a typology that I created based on, on what I've learned, but also based on the literature that I've read um, that's dealing with this topic. So, of course, you have the government, a key function, collective decision and rulemaking, um, issuing orders, making laws. Uh, for instance, it's very important that all Ukrainians have got a, a status that they could work and study here in Austria without going to the asylum system. The dominant mode of organizing of government is bureaucratic organizing, um, which is really has advantage. It creates certainty for situation and scalability of solutions. Uh, think um, the decision, I mean, it was all Europe, but also within Austria, that, that Ukrainians could get access to the labor market. What is the response time? I would say medium to slow. Sometimes it's faster. It depends on what decisions to make. Uh, certain decisions go faster than others. Why I say slow? Uh, because sometimes you make the decision to implement a new funding program. For example, they did it for students. But the rollout of the new funding program took took about a month or a bit more and of course a month is a long time if you have people coming here who think about how can I get food and other questions. What's the durability of this sector and the social structure more permanent? Uh, what does it offer also to other sectors execution capacity? It can provide resources, it can for example give donations or uh, funds to civil society but also buying power. So in the sense of if other sectors do certain services, the government can pay for it. And of course, there's variation uh, within the government as a sector. You have local, provincial, you know, um, federal administrations. You have arm's length agencies and you also have government owned or financed enterprises. Uh, for example, think railway services. Then you have established civil society organizations, uh, which we would call in Germany the Wohlfahrts organizations, uh, like Paritätische in Austria would be the Caritas, uh, I think that's also existing in Germany, in Austria also the Volkshilfe. And those are organizations specializing on addressing certain social needs. They have uh, com combined, I would say, an ideal type thinking, bureaucratic and ad hoc flexible organizing. So they have elaborate organizational structures with, with hierarchies, etc. But they also know how to react flexibly. The response time of these organizations is medium to fast. Uh, think how fast many civil society organizations were to collect food donations and bring them to the Ukraine. Durability, I say quasi-permanent. Why quasi-permanent? Um, because many of these organizations are now very established and secured funding, uh, especially because they do also a lot of tasks where the government pays for. 
And this is also main office to other sectors. They have established interfaces to sectors such as the government. They have execution capacity. They know how to deal with refugee crisis and uh, also have expertise in that field. There is certainly also variation. You have some organizations, civil society organizations that focus more on advocacy. Here we traditionally think about, let's say, Transparent International, focus on advocacy, but then you have organizations who specialize more in service provision and some CSOs, of course, combine both areas. And then, and that's important to me why I created this additional layer of for civil society is <coughs> re-emerging civil society initiatives that really emerge in response to a pressing problem. We engage in ad hoc, bottom-up, flexible organizing. So unorganized people or people who did something in 2015 during the last refugee crisis coming together and just thinking, how can we help uh, Ukrainian refugees? Here the response time is fast to medium. Typically the durability of this kind of social structure, you know, initiatives trying to help with housing or, or donating food, is often temporary, like, let's say six months to a year. Um, what is the main offer to the other sector is can mobilize untapped resources and learning. So for example, in my hometown, Linz uh, civil society initiatives emerged that is led by Ukrainians uh, who came Linz 15 years ago and speak the language and they were part of a part of the civil society organizations organizing help. And there is, of course, variation. There are really ephemeral initiatives where people just come together and in the peak of the crisis, organize some help, you know, give away a place, a room at their place for a short time. But there is also initiatives that formalize a bit and become new civil society organizations, particularly also if they get funding from government or the private sector because and I experienced that myself if you are active in addition to your own job after a few months it's just taking you know you know um, you lose the capacity um, to continue a long-term sustainment in that area so um, this is also a reason why a lot of these initiatives are often temporary um, because it's just additional work based add on to the regular work and, and that can create personal challenges. And for the private sector, key function meeting needs through market-based activities combines bureaucratic and ad hoc organizing, a lot, depending on the type of organization of course, uh, but, but this should Particularly larger corporations have very bureaucratic means of organizing. Response time, medium to fast, uh, the durability of course, um, private companies come and go, but I would say compared to emerging civil society initiatives, definitely more in enduring um, social structure, the organizations within the sector more enduring compared to some emerging civil society initiatives, main offers to other sectors, providing execution capacity. Think about um, companies who owned buses and were critical in transporting refugees from the border um, to, uh, to several cities. And of course, resource provision, uh, such as, as, and here I also come to the variation, donating money, um, to, um, to other organizations, um, but corporate social responsibility could also be an integrated strategy and for some organizations uh, it's uh, even the reason that especially if we think social entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurs as hybrid organizations. But I think it's also like knowing what actors are around. The question is, 
what are the relations between government and now I want to emphasize particularly the relationship between government and civil society because here um, we have quite a lot of literature on, on dealing with that. And to understand how the relations are, we need to understand on the one hand, this model is based on uh, strategic interests, it's based off, uh, from Nayam. And he argues, are the goals, the ends, similar or dissimilar? That's one way of analyzing it. And also the preferred strategizing and organizing principles, the means, are they similar, dissimilar? And if you have similar goals and, and similar organizing principles and strategy, it's cooperation. If you share the goals, but you disagree on how to achieve them, it's more complementarity, different organizing models next to each other. If you have dissimilar goals, but similar organizing principles and strategy, there is some contestation about who has a better solution. Which situations can turn to confrontation where there is disagreement both about the preferred strategies and organizing principles and the goals. And let's have a look at, at how, what this, you know, some examples. So first one is cooperation, uh, sharing goals and similar strategies and how to achieve them. Uh, for example, um, there is a contract relationship between government and NGO as a form of partnership. We see it in refugee crisis, for example, in Austria, in Upper Austria, the local government works, provincial government works together with Volkshilfe and um, Caritas and actually gave them certain tasks. Uh, and this is a... a in this refugee crisis, so here you could speak of a cooperation. Complementarity is when government and civil society share goals but have different strategies and organizing practices to on how to achieve them. And this can be, you know, on the one hand, government favoring really rule-based approaches, and then civil society, you know, we cannot wait for the rules or we cannot wait for you, we want to have flexible, we just want to help. And, and this, so they disagree on, on how to achieve a certain goal. You have contestations, and here I'm going to give you an example, uh, not from the refugee crisis, but from the literature, is where government and civil society share similar strategies, but disagree on goals. Um, so the example they gave in the literature is in developmental work, where um, the NGO who's doing education programs has a different idea what the purpose of education is compared to maybe the local government. But yeah, so, so here you could see this can lead to what's the better model. And this might also be a situation where leading to conflict or confrontation. And this is where government and civil society have completely different goals and disagree on how to achieve them. And here I'm thinking climate movements and various governments disagreeing whether and how to deal with the climate crisis. Um, this could be an example for that. If there is collaboration and even in situation of complementarity and, and understanding how people might move from one quadrant to another, we need to understand some challenges in cross-sectoral collaboration. First one is power asymmetries, particularly between government and NGOs, because the governments are the rule makers and the NGOs often have to accept the rules and that is a power asymmetry can lead to you know, to potential conflicts. You have institutional complexity and spheres with different value orientations come together to cooperate. It creates difficulties, particularly I think situation where bottom up civil society initiatives meet with the government agency and they have problems finding a language um, that the civil society understands why this governments look at you know, the importance of rules 
and why is it important to them but also that the government understands okay here people that want to help quickly and how can we find a way to work together you also have temporal asymmetries and again this it's a good example like that you know some things in government based on the process might take a little bit longer whereas bottom up ad hoc organizing can can move faster and and this temporal asymmetries also might be a source of tension but can also be turned of an advantage because then you say it's good that the civil society steps in so early because they can move fast um, but then government can take over once they figure out all the processes and and make sure this is uh, that you have long tail term scalable solutions and i think another challenge we should not underestimate is that civil society recruits people from other sectors and who then engage in help in the free time. And of course, this might create some problems uh, in terms of, you know, additional burden, but also, for example, let's say if you are a government employee to also do civil society work, do you have some role conflict, etc., etc. So this is something also to think about where does civil society recruit the people from might this create individually these overlaps some challenges for the people I think is worth uh, thinking about and just an outlook and what I also realized when I did this reflection that of course what I did here and what I'm reflecting upon relates to what I'm researching because one of my topic of interest is how can we organize cross-sectoral collaboration addressing UN Sustainable Development Goals? So I looked at the hackathon of the German federal government where seven tech organizations together with the German government brought together 20,000 people who created 1,500 ideas and then worked on after the hackathon on 120 solutions on how to you know, help with the corona crisis and and this is what I'm also researching in the moment. And, and I'm, we, you know, together with my colleague Johanna Meyer, and also developed something about the process, how this happens. And I realized that this reflection I'm doing with you now also helps me a little bit better understanding um, this phenomenon of an ongoing research project. These are the references uh, if you want to have a look at the literature and thank you for being part of this class and that I could share my experiences but also my theoretical reflection with you. And I also prepared a task for you that is related to this idea uh, what is government civil society relations. Bye.